Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 7th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how PFD cuts have been used to buy the state's new higher bond rating. In other words, how it has been built on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Second, we discuss the importance of including non-residents engaged in economic activity in the state as part of the state's overall fiscal plan. And third, we explain our concern with the policy of disqualifying from the university's board of regents those who have pushed for spending cuts at the university. And now, let's join Michael. Brad, let's get started. The latest news, of course, is that there's a new bond rating agency or newer bond rating agency that has come out and given Alaska a double A bond rating. Yay! It's so great. Uh, What they don't tell you, of course, is that it's built on the funeral pyre of the PFD. If you're looking for some imagery, there you go. The funeral (laughs) pyre of the PFD, they have built it on top of that. Am I wrong? Go for it, Brad. (laughs) You're, you're, you're really, you're, you're into it. You're you're, you're getting these things going. Um, So in the uh, Alaska beacon, I haven't seen it picked up anyplace else yet, but in the Alaska beacon, James Brooks has an article that's titled in Alaska's newest credit rating analysts see some economic upside. And um, the first paragraph uh, is a new review by analysts from New York City based Kroll Bond Rating Agency has delivered Alaska's most positive fiscal checkup in years. Uh, the firm, which has not previously examined Alaska, gave the state a double A credit rating in late July, the second highest of the 10 steps in the company's uh, rating scale. And, and so you read that and you go, wow, that's great. You know, we're, we're we're, we're being recognized as getting our spending under control. I have to laugh at this, but we're being recognized as getting our spending under control, that our fiscal policy, our fiscal situation is under control. And, you know, to the outside world, it looks like, you know, we're, we're, we're back in control of the situation until you go into the details of the document. And James doesn't pick this up, by the way, in the article, you have to, you have to go into the details of the, uh, of the report by Kroll to understand what's going on. And here's what's going on. Basically, it they, they've ignored the PFD. Basically, they're saying Alaska's in great fiscal shape if you don't count that PFD thing. Um, uh, and, and they explain that by saying dividend, here's, this is from the report, dividend payments reduce the level of resources available for operating purposes, but the legislature's discretion in setting the APF ERA transfer and the level of dividend payments each year provides flexibility with respect to managing the state's finances. And you go back on into the report and look at some of the detailed financial analysis and what they what they're doing is like like the Alaska Senate treating the PFD as an expense that can be varied up and down depending upon uh, uh, Alaska's uh, 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 financial situation, depending upon other revenues and depending upon spending levels. And, and so they're assuming that the, the report essentially assumes that the PFD will be, will be varied up and down uh, in order to keep Alaska's uh, fiscal situation um, uh, stabilized. That's, that's, I mean, that, that, that's what the report does. That's how we get a, a AA bond rating. 
Uh, that's why, you know, the headline is Alaska's fiscal situation is is under control. And that's what and that's the basis for the Dunleavy administration's uh, uh, press release that says, oh, aren't we aren't we good? Uh, we have a double A bond yeah. rating now. Well, this is Here, this. Oh, wait, before you get into it and, and, and hold that thought. But this is what got me was that the tone in this article and the tone of the press release and the tone of the quote in it is like the administration is looking for kudos for cutting the dividend. That's really what it, I mean, when you read the the what was the the quote, Governor Mike Dunleavy and Department of Revenue Commissioner Adam Crum called the report an upgrade from prior ratings done by the firm. Crum adding that it's a significant achievement and a win for the state. You just cut the PFD by two thirds and it's a significant achievement and win for the what happened to the, what happened to standing tall. What happened to standing tall is what I want to know. I'm sorry, Brad. No, nope, great segue. Great, great segue. Here, here's the deal with these bond ratings, and I've been through a lot of them over the course of, or over the course of my career. The bond rating is a reflection of what the bond agency is, be, the bond rating agency is being told by the company or by the, or by the the state or by the, the the governmental entity, whatever it's rating. It's a reflection of what it's being told. It doesn't make up these numbers. It doesn't make up these statements about about you know how the the state or the the company treats certain revenue items. It doesn't make up the financials that go that go in the back end back end of the report that that are the detail behind the report. It takes those. It takes what's provided by the state, and and uses that then to analyze to to run it through its criteria and analyze whether the whether the entity meets uh, meets you know certain ra- certain rating criteria, and so it's the state that has told the state the Dunleavy administration because this is done by the Department of Revenue. It's done by the debt manager. These presentations are made by the debt manager in the Department of Revenue, which used to be Devin Mitchell, who's now the head of the Permanent Fund Corporation, and is now Ryan Williams, uh, reporting to Adam Crum. Uh, if these uh, 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 presentations are made by the debt manager and it's the administration's debt manager, the Dunleavy administration's debt manager that is telling the rating agency the, the PFD can be used like an accordion. It can be collapsed uh, in order to keep, uh, uh, keep the, the revenue stable or keep the, uh, uh, the, the bottom line stable or it can be expanded don't really talk about it being expanded but but it, but it's it's the it's the debt manager that's explaining these things and providing the numbers to the bond rating agency so while the Dunleavy administration when it comes out with its annual budget uh, and OMB publishes the annual budget while the Dunleavy administration in those documents drops the PFD to the bottom line and drops the PFD out of the calculation of expenses and treats it separately uh, as as it should, as a designated revenue source designated for permanent fund for the permanent fund dividend, while the Dunleavy administration does that when they make the presentation when OMB makes its presentation to the public uh, at the at the time that the governor does e- each budget, back behind the scenes when the debt manager is flying off to New York City to make these presentations to the bond to the bond rating agencies. They're showing the PFD up in the expense items and showing it as an expense of government that can be varied, varied up and down. And they're explaining the PFD. The Dunleavy administration is explaining the PFD to the debt rating agencies as something that can be varied depending upon the the, the fiscal requirements uh, of of any given of any given budget cycle. So, I mean, we got we we've got a clear example here of the Dunleavy administration talking out of both sides of its mouth. You know, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of those businesses that are running two sets of books, one for the IRS to see and one for themselves. You know what I mean? That's the thing. They're treating it as one way when they're over here. And when they're coming to the public, they're treating it the other way over here. I'm your hero. I'm defending it. Look, I've kept it out. And over here, they're like, oh, no, suckers. We're, we're using it as a, as a slush fund to do whatever. That's what it reminds me of. It, it it is, Michael. I mean, they've got one set of books they're showing to the public. They've got one set of books they're they're campaigning on. One set of books that that they're political books about what they claim they're doing uh, with respect to the permanent fund dividend, and then another set of books entirely 
that they're using with respect to the bond rating agencies. I, I'll say this. It's Dunleavy didn't start this. The Dunleavy administration didn't start this. Devin Mitchell started it during the, during the Walker administration, but the Dunleavy administration hasn't stopped it, and 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 hasn't hasn't changed it to reflect the 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 principles, the fiscal principles that he ran on uh, his first time, the fiscal principles he ran on the second time, and the fiscal fiscal principles he talks about when he brings the annual budget forward uh, in December. One more thing to be disappointed about. Let's go on to number two. Why should, sorry, why, why should, why should outsiders, why should non-residents, why should they be involved in state budgets? Why should they have to pay a kick? Why should they, you're going to tell us what's going on here. So the, the article that, that triggered this is again in the Alaska Beacon. It's by Yerith Rosen. The he headline is workforce shortages could sabotage Anchorage and Alaska Economic Opportunities Report says, and it's the report, they're reporting on the report by uh, Bill Pop uh, at last week's uh, Alaska uh, Economic or Anchorage Economic Development Corporation uh, and three annual report, annual presentation of its uh, three-year uh, Alaska, uh, three-year outlook. And it's talking about, um, well, here it is. It's talking about uh, uh, the Alaska, the Anchorage workforce and the Alaska workforce and, and raising issues about whether those workforces are adequate to meet the job opportunities, the growing job opportunities uh, that are out there. And there is one piece in this that I just found fascinating and we'll, and we'll want to talk about more after the break. But, but here's the paragraph that I found fascinating. It says, in Anchorage, one out of every four jobs are held by people who do not live in the city. That includes 12%, so that's 25%, right? Uh, that includes 12% of Anchorage job holders who are commuters from elsewhere in Alaska, mostly the outlaw, outlying Matt Sue Borough. And 13%, 13% of the Anchorage workforce of job holders who are non-Alaskans traveling here for shift work or seasonal work or who never come to Alaska at all because they are working remotely uh, from elsewhere. That's a huge number, 13% of the Anchorage workforce. He's not talking about the state workforce. He's talking about the Anchorage workforce, which is, you know, where people live. 13% of the Anchorage workforce is coming uh, is coming from out of staters. So we need to talk about what that means. I want to talk about what that means from a fiscal policy standpoint and what, uh, what we should be doing uh, with respect to uh, those outsiders. Uh, this is a fascinating topic in part because part of it touches on something I'm going to touch on later on in the show, which is this remote working thing. But you're right. Even if you're remote working, you have to contribute in some way. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. It is the weekly top three. We were into number two, talking about it a bit here, which is the out-of-state workforce uh, is makes up a big part of Alaska. We were talking about Anchorage. 13% of the overall workforce in Anchorage is out-of-state workers, and whether that means they fly up, they're seasonal, or even remote workers, um, it's a big problem in a lot of ways. Brad, give me your thoughts on this. Well, it's a big, it's a big issue. I mean, we, we, it's good to have jobs. It's good to have the jobs in Anchorage. It's good to, for those jobs to be available. To be available. Uh, but that's a big chunk of the workforce that's coming from out of state. And they're putting a, I mean, they put a burden on the state. Uh, they put the, you know, they, they drive on roads, they uh, demand government services or they expect government services while they're here. Uh, there is a burden that's put on the state by out of, by the out of state, uh, out of state workforce. And they ought to contribute to the costs uh, of government in every other state uh, that uses either a sales tax or a, uh, an income tax as part of the state revenue scheme, non-resident workers, non-residents contribute to the costs uh, of state government. And it reduces the burden uh, on in-state, uh, on, on residents, when non-residents pay a chunk of the cost of government. They expand the cost of government a little bit, but they pay a significant, they pay a, a share of the cost of government uh, when they when the state either has a sales tax or an income tax. In Alaska, we don't do that. In Alaska, all of the burden uh, at a personal level is being put on middle and lower income Alaska families by using PFD cuts. All of the burden is on Alaska residents. Non-residents at the state level, non-residents aren't contributing 
uh, to the cost uh, to the cost of government. And and, you know, that could that's a that's a big percentage. Thirteen percent of the workforce in Anchorage is coming from out of state. When ICER did the, the 2016 study, they estimated based upon the numbers then that seven to 15 percent of the cost of state government could be depending upon which revenue source you use, whether you use sales taxes or income taxes, a flat rate income tax or a progressive income, progressive rate income tax, uh, that seven to 15 percent of the costs of state government could be borne by non-residents. And that reduces, keep in mind, that reduces the share of government that then has to be paid for by, by the remaining Alaskans. Put another way, Alaskans using the PFD only, Alaskans are paying 7 to 15% more than they otherwise would if we had non-residents in uh, uh, contributing a share of the cost of government. So when you have, if, this, if that number were only 2% or 3%, uh, maybe you would say, oh, it's too small to, to mess with. It's too small to, to worry about. Let's not gear fiscal policy around trying to go after those dollars. But when you've got 13% of the largest city in the state's workforce, half the state's population, when you've got 13% uh, coming from out of state, that's something you think about. I mean, how are you going to get them to contribute a proportionate share of the cost of government. One other factor that always that always always you know really gets me going on this on this issue. These people are paying if they come from income tax states or sales tax states. These people are paying taxes to their local state government. If they're coming from income tax states, they're paying tax in that state in their state of residence. They're paying tax on the income they're earning in Alaska. That, but that revenue is going to help the state uh, that they come from. Oklahoma. I have friends. I have friends in Oklahoma who come up uh, and and work in Alaska. They pay Oklahoma state income tax on the on the income they get in Alaska. That goes to help the state of Oklahoma. If we taxed it in Alaska uh, at whatever rate we set, if we taxed it and ta tax the Alaska share of their income in Alaska, it would go to benefit Alaska. Where they where they've earned that income, and it would be deducted from their tax obligation uh, in Oklahoma. They wouldn't pay tax twice. It would be there'd be an allocation between the two. But Oklahoma is saying, "Hey, if ta if Alaska isn't going to tax it, great for us. We'll we'll tax it, and we'll take that additional revenue in and help reduce the burden on Oklahoma residents uh, by getting Alaska essentially to contribute a part of it." So it's. This this is a screwed up fiscal situation we've gotten ourselves into, and it's and it's the consequence of of doing whatever we ever we can to avoid taxing the top twenty percent right by pushing the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families through using through using PFD cuts, and and the and the non residents thirteen percent of the Alaska of the Anchorage workforce, the non residents are getting a free ride. Uh, as a result of as a result of that policy, it's wrong. It's bad. It's well. It's, it's put. It's putting an undue burden on Alaska residents that shouldn't be there. And they're not necessarily getting a free ride because a lot of them are paying taxes in their home state, so they're still paying it. And why would they care whether it goes to Oklahoma or goes to Alaska if it's essentially the same, one way or the other? Um, it doesn't. You know, it, I don't think it would matter necessarily to them. Um, and, uh, it's a significant chunk. In fact, I think if I remember correctly, you one time actually ran the numbers on how much money is lost through that. Um, and if I recall correctly, it was two or $300 million. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? No, that, and that's using the old ICER numbers of seven to 15%, the, the 2016 study numbers of, 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 ten, of, uh, seven to 15%. Hammond, uh, used a figure of 25%. And, and we may be getting back to the days of 25%. When you look at the slope, so, so what happens when we have activity on the slope, construction activity on the slope, is we import a lot of workers because we those, those workers have sort of dissipated. They've gone into the economy. They've left the state. They've done something elsewhere in the economy. They've done something when slope activity comes down. So when slope activity ramps back up, we typically have met that gap by bringing in out-of-state workers. So the 13, I, I'm going to guess that the 13% that, that Pop's talking about in the Anchorage workforce, 
uh, is, is is sort of the low end of what we're seeing statewide when you count in the activity uh, on the slope. And that's, I mean, that's a, so so you, using the ICER numbers from 2016 may be understating the amount of revenue that we're missing, the, the amount of overburden that we're putting on Alaska residents because we're not getting a contribution from uh, from non-residents. So would you uh, quickly here, would you <clears throat> suggest a just a non-resident tax mm, or would you suggest a tax that would um, or would you suggest a tax that would uh, have an exemption for state in state residents? I mean, what do you, what do you think? So um, uh, Matt Berman from ICER uh, came up with a, 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 an excellent analysis of how to deal with uh, this situation uh, in, a, in a piece he did for the ADN earlier this year. And basically what he does is convert the P PFD into an income tax credit and says, if you, if you can use your PFD as an income tax credit. So if you have uh, 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 an income tax obligation of just to pick numbers to make sense, a hundred dollars and you have a PFD of $50, um, then you can use the PFD as a credit against your against your income tax your your income tax obligation, um, and the break point is somewhere around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Those below two hundred and fifty, if you use a flat tax, those below two hundred fifty thousand dollars wouldn't pay uh, an income tax at all. Uh, those above would uh, contribute something of an income tax, and and it would have the effect then. Of uh, since non-residents don't have a PFD, it would have the effect then of putting the tax burden, a bigger share, frankly, of the tax burden uh, over on non-residents. I always find it ironic. Somebody like Bill Pop, and Bill Pop, by the way, now resigned from AEDC and running for Anchorage mayor. Um, just another example of shuffling government bureaucrats because i mean aedc although it's they call it a nonprofit, it's almost completely funded by the city this is a city funded just like all the economic development corps around the state are pretty much almost exclusively funded by the either the the boroughs the cities or some kind of federal grant where they're in there you know they're doing studies and making money on the alaska study industry kind of docket for all these different things. And now he's going to go in and make Anchorage great again or whatever he's going to do. Um, but this is, this is some serious irony here, Brad. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe that, maybe he's setting his, uh, maybe this report was nothing more than setting his, uh, the tone of his, of his upcoming campaign, if that's indeed what he does. I mean, that's what the rumors are. I don't think he's well, announced yet. No, but I mean, it's, it's been, it's, it's in the public. He hasn't made the official announcement, but he's out asking for money. And even after this luncheon, he was heard told telling people that he was running for mayor. So, uh, I mean, it's made the papers and everything else. So he hasn't made the official announcement, but I guarantee you it's coming. Well, the announcement then, then his platform is going to be: I'm going to make Anchorage great again. I'm going to bring all these all these jobs back uh, uh, for uh, Alaskans. I mean, it, it is true. We're 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 on a, a a rising tide here in terms of in terms of jobs in Alaska, and we're on a rising tide in terms of in terms of job jobs on the North Slope. I mean, if if, if Willow and Pika go forward, uh, there's going to be a tremendous amount of uh, work up on the North Slope and, and a tremendous amount of kickoff work. Uh, that goes on in town and and in in other parts of the state, and he's and he's also true. I mean, one of the consequences this is this is nationwide. This is not just Alaska, but one of the consequences of COVID and and the early retirements that people took is that the workforce is down. We've lost a, we've lost the a, a significant share of the older part of the workforce due to uh, regular retirements and early retirements, um, and and a lot of that has taken taking wind out of the sails of, uh, of having enough people to, for the jobs, the rising jobs that are coming out there. So Alaska has always uh, uh, filled that gap between jobs on the one hand uh, and, and, you know, people in the state uh, uh, employed uh, stepping up to those jobs. On the other hand, they've always filled them with, with out-of-staters. This is a, this seems to be to me a particularly high number uh, uh, as we, as we have the rising tide of jobs and the and the and the dropping in the in the workforce, 
the gap seems to be growing and and this seems to be a a big number of jobs and that's and this is just in anchorage i mean this is just the so this isn't reflecting north slope jobs at all which i would guess if this is what's going on in anchorage i would guess we're having the same sort of gap show up on the slope and we're having the same sort of influx we're going to be having the same sort of influx of, of out-of-staters outsiders coming in to, to fill the jobs on the slope as pika and uh, willow uh, gear up yeah well and and of course covid had a lot of impacts so we i've had a lot of discussions uh about this uh many of my clients uh in the radio world uh you know advertising clients uh, are all basically stating the same thing. They don't have enough qualified employees. They don't have enough people who will show up to work. They don't have enough people who want to stay on the job. Uh, COVID had some real ramifications. Um, my speculation, and this is a complete and total sidebar from what Brad has been talking about, but I'll, I'll get his t- take on this. My speculation is, is that COVID and all the fear mongering that went around COVID, the fear porn that you saw coming out of the TV and out of the radio all the time, um, made people really face their own mortality. And it kind of changed their mindset from keeping up with the Joneses or having the next nice thing to people were afraid. And now they want to, now they value memories over stuff. They value making memories and doing things and spending time with doing the things that they love versus being in a cage for eight hours a day or 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week. And so there, I think a lot of them are just basically doing the bare minimum just to get a buy so they can enjoy experiences and things like that. I think that's been one of the fundamental changes. Uh, that very, that very well could be Michael. I mean, the numbers that I've seen, um, uh, and I've, and I've seen more numbers at a national level than I, than I have at the state level, to be honest, but the numbers I've seen are showing the early retirements really has, has been a big driver in, in the reduction in, uh, in the workforce. I mean, what, what happens when you have early retirements is people in the, in the middle bracket, people halfway through their career move up. And then people in the lower, you know, the people who are just starting their career move up to what was previously the the filled by the middle bracket. And so you don't have that 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 initial uh, uh, workforce, young workforce go able to go into service or available to go into service jobs. They've moved up. Right. No, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, we'll see what uh, we'll see what comes of it. All right, let's move on to number three. Uh, why can't fiscal hawks be part of the University Board of Regents? Um, we just saw Tucker Mint Babcock after two months throw in the towel uh, because he said it takes too much of his time. I don't know if there's a code in there or something for it, but it looks like whatever's happening, they uh, do not want anybody who's looking for efficiencies or any kind of cuts to the university to be part of the Board of Regents, Brad. Yeah, this is so Tuckerman's the second one who uh, uh, who Dunleavy's appointed, who is going through this this situation, um, and it's um, it, it's concerning. Um, Bethany Markham was the was the first. Bethany Markham was a, was was named by the Dunleavy to the board. She was not confirmed by the by the legislature, and now Tuckerman uh, who. Uh, was appointed by the by Dunleavy to the board is just backing out before he goes into the, conf- the confirmation process, and this is from the Alaska Beacon's article on Tuckerman's announcing or discussing Tuckerman's decision. It says some legislators say they thought Babcock's confirmation would be unlikely. He was a supporter of Dunleavy's deep cuts to the university budget in 2019, among the reasons legislators cited when they rejected. Uh, Bethany Markham uh, for the same role. That that's bothersome. Now, Bethany had other baggage. Tuckerman has other baggage, and I can sort of understand legislators having issues with both of them for other reasons. And 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 maybe the the opposition to the um, or the the support for Dunleavy spending cuts. Uh, at the university is just sort of a cover story for these other reasons that they're that legislators voted against them. But to the extent legislators are saying, we're not going to support you for for the appointment to the board because you supported budget cuts to the university uh, back uh, in the early earlier in the Dunleavy administration. That's a bad that's a bad idea. It, it, I mean, basically, they're saying the only people we're going to support to go on the university board or university board or university cheerleaders, people who want to see all that spending stay at the university, people who are not looking for cuts 
people who are not looking for efficiencies, people who are not looking, uh, asking hard questions about university spending. We don't want those people on the board. We, we want, we want only university cheerleaders uh, on the board. And that's, that, 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 that would be a very bad result because the board is sort of the first line of defense in terms of, in terms of keeping costs down at the university. They're the ones that have the, the closest feel for what the university is spending. And if we're saying we only want cheerleaders on that board, then we're basically saying we're going to give the university just free reign, do whatever the heck they want, spend whatever yeah. the heck they want. It's a blank check instead of uh, a watchdog, which is what the re- part of the job of the regents uh, is supposed to be a watchdog on the university to make sure that they're being you know, ethical and efficient and everything else with the public monies. And if all they're going to get is people who are hype, hype, rah, rah, all you're going to get is more and more and more uh, to the university. Brian says, ethical universities? Ha, 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 ha. Um, I mean, there... <laughs> There's an argument there for that, but that's part of what the regents are supposed to do, right? I mean, they're supposed to make sure that everything is run. And it is, they become bastions of uh, of bigger, stronger government as long as they get their kick. It doesn't matter what else is going on, Brad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right, Michael. And and it's, it's you want to appoint people who are solid fiscal conservatives. You, at, at least as a, sh- as a part of the board, you want to appoint people who are solid fiscal conservatives who are looking at the bottom line, who are looking at, at spending, who are looking at efficiencies, who are looking at ways to run the run the university more efficiently, lower cost. Uh, you want, or, or at least not bigger cost, you want people uh, as part of the mix, uh, in there as part of the mix. And if we're, if we're now saying, oh, if you support a budget cuts to the university, you were never going to put you on the university board, then... We, we're, we've taken out a lot of people, and 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 I would guess most of the fiscal conservatives uh, from consideration for the board. the The board is not supposed to be a cheerleader. The board is supposed to be an oversight, the closest oversight that you can have, outside oversight that you can have of the university. The legislature, the legislature is several steps removed from being able to peer into the university, having having the day to day contact. Uh, seeing the monthly reports or the periodic reports, legislature several steps removed from the university. And and frankly, maybe this is part of how we got into the problem with the university in the first place. We didn't have a board that was exercising strong oversight uh, of the uh, of the of the universities of the spending side and the efficiency side of what the university was doing. So I it, it is troubling. I, as I say, there was there was other baggage that Bethany brought. Um, in terms of her you know, service on the redistricting board, there's other baggage that Tuckerman brings in terms of his uh, his involvement in the the so-called loyalty oath uh, issue uh, uh, early in the in the Dunleavy administration, and maybe this maybe the, the 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 spending thing is or the the support for spending cuts is just a cover for voting against them for those other reasons, but but it we should be very the governor should be very clear about this. I'm going to appoint fiscal conservatives. I'm going to appoint people who are looking at the university from the standpoint of increasing efficiencies, lowering spending where, where it's appropriate to do so. And, and the legislature should not be saying, oh, no, we're not going to. The legislature should not push back and say, oh, no, we're not going to put those people on the board. We only want cheerleaders uh, on the board and build it bigger, bigger, bigger. Because that's I mean, <laughs> that's. That's that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for going right back into the situation that we had that led the governor to push for big spending cuts uh, to the university in the first place. I uh, yeah, and it's sucking up so much of the oxygen uh, in the room and and consuming just such a tremendous amount of overhead in the state. Um, and we're seeing across the country right now, we're seeing a pushback against universities in total. Uh, for many reasons, but fiscal reasons are definitely one of them. And as you've pointed out in the past, Alaska spends more than any of her counterparts in the Western states uh, by an order of magnitude uh, on the universities. And uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's sustainable in the long run. I don't think it's sustainable either, Michael. And and you know the fact is we still have three separate universities. We still have you know two basketball teams. We still have 
we still have a lot of things that we duplicate in this state uh, that, you know, frankly, if you if you if you look at the fiscals, aren't justified. So it's I, we need people on that board that are pushing back. Now, I you know, maybe we need cheerleaders on the board, too. But by gosh, we don't need all the board to be a cheerleader. Uh, we need people who are pushing back and at least can identify where those efficiencies are and at least help legislators who are interested in in finding those efficiencies and finding those spending cuts at least are positioned to be able to help the legislators uh, and the administration uh, do that. If we don't have those sorts of people on the board, uh, at least part of the board, then we're just, you know, we're going to, we're going to rebuild this, this, this behemoth again and, and run ourselves into a, into another issue down the road. Well, and going back to your workforce discussion earlier on, I mean, that's part of the problem. Why we're importing is because we're not teaching to what Alaska has to offer, right? I mean, we're having to import all this, uh, all these jobs and everything else, shouldn't the university be focusing on those things so we don't have to import other people? Yeah. So you, yeah, yeah. So that's really a separate issue about what should the university be teaching, and and Governor Dunleavy's uh, most recent before Tuckerman, the the appointment before Tuckerman, said that he was going to focus on jobs, that he was going to focus on on creating on, on his his role in the board was going to be focusing on getting the university to teach to jobs. Um, and, and that's a, that's a good, I mean, you want that mix on the board as well, but, but that doesn't necessarily lead you to, to, you know, the most efficient or the most, uh, uh, uh cost-effective, uh, answer. It teaches you, it, it leads you to, yeah, we're going to focus on jobs. We're going to have, we're going to have a major emphasis on, on teaching to jobs, but it doesn't, you don't necessarily sit there and go, and we're going to do it in the most cost-effective manner. You need people on the board who sit there and go, whatever the heck, whatever the heck we're doing, we need to do it in the most cost-effective, most efficient manner possible. And that's that's the kind of of criteria that at least that paragraph suggests legislators are using as a as a as a as a tool to vote against people, people who come in and say we're going to be be efficient and we're going to we're going to you know, do it in the most cost-effective and efficient manner. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, a pleasure to speak with you. Again, Michael, as always, thank, Michael, as always thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.